Good morning, Makers Church. You can have a seat. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is so good to be together. Um, if we've never met, my name's Derek. I serve here as a lead pastor, and I'm so glad that you're all with us this morning. Last week was Easter, and we had an incredible time celebrating the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And Easter is such an important time of the year for, uh, for the church at large because it marks perhaps the most significant moment in all of human history. And because of that, many of us converge to church on one day. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the time of year where a lot of our normal regulars all show up on the same day, and it's a time where new folks come for the first time. And um, if you were new last week and you're back this week, welcome back. Two weeks in a row, we can clap you up. Um, and if you're brand new with us this week, we're also so glad that you're here. Kyler invited you to our New to Makers event. We'd love to see you at that afterwards and welcome you into the life of our community. Um, you know, this is also a time of year where we have spring breaks. And for whatever reason, the school system like, can't get on the same page. So it's been like a month of spring breaks, you know, for families in our church and for those of you who are college students or work at schools. Uh, but I think, I think we're about done. I know our kids go back to school tomorrow. Uh, we had an awesome week. We went camping in the desert with some of our closest friends. And to be honest, this isn't my favorite camping trip uh, because normally we go to the desert and we do what we love. We ride dirt bikes and uh, we have a blast in the desert in an area with, with no rules. That's what we love about the desert. But this trip is with a bunch of friends and we go to like an RV resort in Borrego. And it's a very different trip. It's pretty, there's a pool, there's a golf course. I hate golfing, so it doesn't do it for me. You can fish in the ponds at the golf course. I hate fishing, so it doesn't really do it for me. Um, and, but it's just a different kind of trip, and I'm, I'm learning to adjust with it. But the, the hardest thing is there's rules everywhere. There's like hosts popping out of every corner, like, you're breaking rules. And we're like, this is lame. And, but what was surprising to me is my son, you know, I have some of my closest friends, they love to golf. And I have FOMO for everything in life except for fishing and golfing. <laughs> and they were like, hey, we're going golfing today. I'm like, later, nerds, have fun. And my son, who's 12, was like, Dad, I want to golf. And I'm like, great. Uncle Sean will take you golfing. <laughs> and Sean was like, I ain't taking your kid golfing. If you, if you want him to golf, you got to come. So I went golfing. And I hate to admit it, but it was kind of fun. Um, and it was only because we, we played like a scramble, like best ball, which I didn't know what any of this meant. But I was like, oh, you, like my teammate who knows how to golf hits a great ball and I get to hit from where he landed. I like this game. It's fun. But all that being said, we, we are uh, we're entering into kind of a new season also in the church calendar. right? I think we're feeling that, like Pastor Mark said, the change of the season, even though seasons are relative here in San Diego. But we're in Easter tide now, which is uh, historically celebrated as this period in church calendar where it's after the resurrection of Jesus. And we're, we're beginning to see kind of the move of God in the world through this thing that's beginning called his church. And so what we want to do today is we want to kind of pick up where we left off. We're starting a new trilogy of series today. Um, I know you're like, whoa, we haven't had a series in a while. Because last year, remember, we walked through the whole church liturgical calendar together. And then this year, we've been in these practices of, of, of Jesus. But now we're kind of kicking off a trilogy of series. And I just want to give you a roadmap for where we're headed. What we're, what we're going to be doing is looking at the life of Jesus through one particular person named Peter. And we're going to look at Jesus through Peter for a while. Like we're starting today, the first of three of a, of a trilogy. This series is called In the Fire. And really what we're, we're going to get to is making sense of this spark that ignited in the, in the world when Jesus came, lived, died, and resurrected. And he began this movement of his followers called the church. And in this kind of post-resurrection, pre-Pentecost period, this season, there's some really interesting things happening, but we thought it would be fun to look at all of that through the, the life of one person, one person that Jesus interacted with. Now, he interacted with thousands and thousands of people, but he had his 12, his disciples that he invited to follow him, and even within his 12, he had three who were kind of the closest to him, Peter, James, and John, and we're going to look at Peter. We're just going to look at Jesus through the life of Peter for a, for a while, um, and, and, and we're going to see what, what happens and see if we can find ourselves 
in the story. So in order to kind of pick up where we left off, we're going to go back a little bit into, into Peter's life. But let's, let's start where we ended last week. And if you were here last week, we talked about uh, the story of Jesus revealing himself after he resurrected to these two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus. It's a beautiful story. And at the end of that story, we come to this passage, Luke chapter 24, verse 32. It says, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road again and opened up the scriptures to us? And they talk about this, this spark in their hearts that began to burn. Even before they had recognized or realized the fullness of who Jesus was, and, and, and as he was, they hadn't even recognized him yet, but they could sense something begin afresh inside of them. And really the big idea of, of this series we're kicking off today, called In the Fire, is this idea that when we come into a relationship with Jesus... It's as if a spark ignites in our hearts, in our lives, setting ablaze everything within us, starting really what what, what many of us would refer to as like a fire of transformation, a transforming, a refining fire inside of our lives. And it's the fire of Jesus' grace and his love and all of his beauty and goodness that is shifting and shaping things inside of us slowly transforming us, sometimes painfully slowly, but transforming us nonetheless. And what we see as we walk with Jesus, and we're going to see this through the life of Peter over and over and over again, and if you're here and you've walked with Jesus in any portion of your life, you'll know this to be true, that Jesus begins to burn away these unhealthy things inside of our hearts and our minds, our doubts, our fears, our insecurities, our brokenness, our And ultimately, our sinfulness. And he refines us at the deepest part of who we are. And and we're going to see this unfolding as we we continue looking at the life of Peter. And I I love that this Road to Emmaus story ties us to this person, Peter. We'll see it here. It says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. This is after Jesus broke the bread and Jesus revealed himself to them. And, and they say this, they said they found the 11 and those with them, so more than 11, a bunch of them, assembled together. And they're saying now, it's true. This, this, this resurrection of Jesus rumor, it's true. The rumor is going throughout all of the land. They hadn't believed it for themselves, but now they've, they've experienced Jesus in real time. And they're going, it's true. But this is so interesting to me. They don't give an eyewitness account to prove their credibility. They say this. They say, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So then the two of them were told, told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So it's th- this, little, this little tether is so interesting to me. It says, it's true And before they tell about their own story, before they talk about what happened to them on the way and the whole experience they had just had, they said, it's true, Jesus revealed himself to Simon. Now, if you don't know, Simon and Peter are the same person. In fact, so many times in the scriptures, he's referred to as Simon Peter. And Peter must have been in that room with them. This is the 11, right? We know Judas had already betrayed Jesus, and he's no longer one of the disciples. And so there's the 11 plus those that were with them, and they're there, and they they burst into the room, and they're like, it's true. Jesus revealed himself to Simon. Now, I have no idea why they they lead with this statement. Why are they they name-dropping? We do that sometimes, don't we, right? Like, we want people to believe us, but we don't think they'll believe us, so we'll, we'll, we'll name someone who they think they will believe. And... And, and the scholars, they don't really understand how they even knew that Jesus had revealed himself to Simon. But they know that he revealed himself to them. And I don't know what to make sense of that other than it's a great tether to the life of Peter. Because Peter's in this room. He's walked with Jesus for at least three years. And he was an eyewitness to all that Jesus had done and said. 
And now we know that after the resurrection, Jesus had also revealed himself to Simon Peter. But how did Peter end up here? How, how did Peter end up in the room in the first place? So what I want to do is I want to go all the way back to the very beginning of Peter and Jesus meeting one another. It says this. Well, for, first of all, before we unpack it, Peter and his brother Andrew are fishermen. And they're just, they just woke up one morning and they went to work. You ever done that? You just woke up one morning and you went to work. It was just another day. A plain old day on the Sea of Galilee, their place of employment. And it says this in Matthew 4.18. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. <laughs> Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. What we see taking place in this story is Jesus has just been baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, and he is just beginning his public ministry. This is his first interaction with a, a rabbi inviting someone to follow them, to come study under them. And he walks up to these two fishermen, these brothers, and James and John are there as well. They're in business together. They're fishermen, and he just walks up to them. They have no idea who he is, and he says, come follow me. And they do. And that's how three years later, Peter ends up in the room with the 11 as these two from Emmaus come back and say, it's true. Jesus is who he said he is. He's done what he said he would do. just want to unpack just this short passage this morning. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. In that one sentence, we see this theme that we see throughout all of the scriptures. This beautiful truth. That it's Jesus who comes and finds us. Not us who have to go and find Jesus. We saw this last week as we celebrated Easter. We saw Jesus show up and walk alongside the two on the road to Emmaus as they walk away defeated and, and downcast and, and overwhelmed by things not going the way they thought they would. And we see it happening all the way here at the beginning that Jesus comes and he finds us as we are, where we are. He comes to us, and thankfully, Jesus is this wonderful one that comes and finds us just as we are, where we are. There is no pilgrimage we have to take. There is no cat and mouse game of hide and seek. There is no merit or earning or seeking or finding. Jesus is the one who comes to us. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that incredible? And, and why to Peter. I know it's easy for us to go, well, they were disciples. You know who they were before they were disciples? Nobody. This is what we know about the life of Peter. Peter was a fisherman by trade. We know that from this passage. He, he was in business with his brother Andrew and his friends James and John. And if you know anything about life, you should never go into business with family or close friends. So they're already breaking all the rules. Um, and we know this about Peter. What's very interesting is he was married. And we don't know if any of the other disciples were married. It doesn't say, but we know it does say that he was. As later on in, in Matthew, it talks about his mother-in-law. And that, that will come into play here in a moment as we look at the life of Peter. Um, but what we see in the life of Peter, what we kind of know about him as we look at his life and study his life, I identify with him so much on this front. He was bold and impulsive. <laughs> I love this about him. He was so impulsive. Like, he, he talked before he thought. He gets himself in trouble all the time. But his, his impulsiveness was, like, endearing in a way. Like, he's the one who stepped right out of the boat to walk on water and then quickly began to sink. He's the one um, who just, without even thinking about it, just professes and confesses that Jesus is Lord. He's also the one who pulls out a sword and cuts off an ear. And, and so he was this, this mixed bag of, 
of chaos and beauty, just like all of us. We, we know that he was a Jewish man living in a Roman-occupied land, that, that being in, in business in this land occupied by the Romans was probably very, very challenging. Um, and that's about, that's about it. Why Peter? What business did Peter have to do with getting involved in God's business? So if you could just for a moment, if you would even just close your eyes, I just want you to think about if you're a person in this room or, or you're watching online and you're someone who has chosen to follow Jesus with your life, I want you to just think for a moment, who were you? Where were you? What was your life like when you encountered Jesus? Do you remember? Our stories are so different. Some of you grew up knowing nothing different. You grew up in a Christian household. You grew up like my kids are growing up right now, like just in church all the time, and they didn't know any different. And coming to know Jesus is... It's something they have to decide on their own at some point in their life, but man, they've kind of always known about Jesus. Or or maybe you have some radical story where Jesus met you in the deepest, darkest place of your life when you were at rock bottom. Or maybe you were like me. You were a a young punk kid from a broken home. I talked a little bit about this last week. Um, I I, I was a lost and broken and kind of a, a... a rebel rouser. I was kind of a a hoodlum as a kid. And I I had nothing to offer Jesus. Like there was no reason why he should pick me for the team. I I, I literally had nothing nothing to offer. No money, no skills, no influence. I grew up in a tiny little nothing town in the middle of what we called the butt crack of California. Didn't have good behavior. And yet we see this invitation that Jesus gives Peter, and he's given all of us. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. And a lot of times we can hear those words, those invitation, this invitation that Jesus gives us. And if we are, are kind of narrow-minded, we'll think about it in such a way that it is that one time where you kind of have your eyes open or, or curious about Jesus and you say yes to him. You kind of, you cross that line of faith. And you're like, I'm going from someone who does not yet believe in Jesus or follow Jesus to a marked moment in your life where you cross that line of faith and you're like, Jesus, I'm going to follow you or I believe in you, or you pray the prayer, or you do the thing. And that's a beautiful moment in our lives. But what's bigger than that is this is not just that. It's more than that. This invitation to come, follow me. It's a daily invitation that Jesus gives us every single day of our lives. It's not a one-time event. It's not a, 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 a one and done We don't just go, yeah, Jesus, I believe in you, and then just go about our lives. Because this is what the scriptures say. Jesus says, come, follow me. And I think about in this moment when Peter and Andrew, they they drop their nets. We see that in a moment, and they follow him. Well, you know what they did? They went to bed that night, and they woke up the next morning, and they followed him again. And they went to bed the next night, and they woke up in the morning. And they followed. And Jesus wasn't chilling. Jesus was on the move. He was moving from town to town. And sometimes in the most obnoxious route. Any of you guys like mapping nerds? Like my wife maps her way home from here. Not that she doesn't know how to get home, but she's like, it tells me if there's a traffic jam or whatever. Sometimes it's the 805. Sometimes the 15. Sometimes surface streets are better. Texas is sometimes the best way down to Mission Valley. And... I'm like, okay, I get it. I like efficiency. And some of us, we love efficiency so much. And when you're following Jesus, he's like, 
bebopping around, zigzagging his way through, sometimes going around, sometimes going straight through. And every day they wake up, they have the choice, will I follow him? This is the same question that we're faced with daily as we disciple under Jesus. And this is what he says, and I find this so fascinating. He says, come and follow me. And then there's a promise attached to it. And I will make you fishers of men. Or I will make you go fish for people, is what he says. What stands out to me in this one little phrase is this one word, make. I know that's the name of our church, and of course it would stand out to me, Maker's Church. But I love this reality of who God is and the way God works. He says, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He doesn't say, and you will be fishers of men. He doesn't say, no, come and follow me, and boom, transaction, you're done. He, he doesn't say, you, you have become this. He says, no, no, no. If you come and follow me, on this meandering journey, I will make, I will transform, I will repurpose your life, and I will put you about my business. See, when we follow Jesus, his business becomes our business. And it's in the process of us doing his business that we are made, that we are reshaped, re-transformed in our lives. Now, I got to admit, I wish it wasn't like this. I would love to be an overnight success. I would love to just be like, Jesus, I believe in you. Boom, different. I'm not jealous or greedy or envious or selfish or self-centered. I, all those things are gone. I, I would love for that to happen. But no, Jesus... He says, no, 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 I'm going to bring you into my business, but I'm going to do it the way I'm going to do it. And what we see in the, in the, is that God is a wonderful creator. He's so creative that he isn't just a former. He doesn't just form things. He's not just an inventor, right? But he's also a reformer. He, 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 he repurposes. He reforms. And he says, along this journey, I will make you fishers of men. And he's making us more like him in this lifelong journey of following him. And I love this metaphor that he's using. Remember, he's talking to fishermen, so of course he's going to make them fishers of men. Right? We, sometimes we get caught up on this, and we, we take the metaphor too far, and we're like, well, I hate fishing. I don't want to be fisher of men. You know what I mean? Like... Uh, I, I don't like fishing. I think it's boring. And I'm impatient. Maybe that's what Jesus is working on in my heart. So maybe he does want to make me a fisherman. I don't know. But what we see in this, in this metaphor is he's saying, no, no, no. I'm not just asking you to change professions. Right? He doesn't say, like, you were a fisher. And now I'm going to pull you out. And you're going to be my disciple. And you're, and you're going to go fish for people. It's not just this, this like, on the nose metaphor. He says, no, no. I'm not going to ask you to just change your profession. This is an invitation into a radical transformation of your purpose and your identity. And he will use your natural talents, skills, experiences, and giftings to put you to task for his purposes. And we see this all throughout the scriptures. When Jesus calls him and his brother John, or his brother Andrew and James and John, his friends, to become fishers of men, he's calling them to become his disciples, and be about his business, which is assisting in, participating in, co-laboring in the salvation of others. That, that for some reason, God's plan A was to use broken people like us to draw people to himself. Now, a more fitting metaphor for me, I love matchmaking. Single people perked up. They're like, huh? I love my wife and I. We love, like, we love matchmaking. Not just like romantic relationships, but friendships, you know. And, and so I, I would, I, I really see the, what God puts us up to in his business is like matchmaking, right? It's like, oh, you? You should meet him. 
And if you two came together, magic would happen. And this is, this is how we help people come to know Jesus. Or, or sometimes it's, it's, it's about being a, uh, uh, just a messenger to help people connect dots about what's going on in their lives. But this is the business he puts us up to, is to help people to come to know Jesus. Right? This is like, sometimes we want to like screw it around. What does it mean to be fishers of men? What does it mean to be about God's business? And it is about connecting people who are far from God and help them come to know him because when he transforms us, it's in that transformation process that his kingdom comes and his will is done on earth through his people. As we love and serve and give and become transformed. But he won't make us all fishers of men. He'll use our experiences, our talents, our giftings to do that. And so we see this other, other like kind of metaphors in the scriptures. He, he gives kind of practical things, spiritual purposes. Like farming. He uses that metaphor, ag- agrarian, all throughout, right? You won't just like farm fields, but you can like plant seeds and harvest you can water. You can, you can be part of the fruit of God's kingdom coming. Or if you're a teacher, we have some teachers in the room. You're not just teaching like math and science. You're, you're teaching like the truth of all reality. Or you're a conveyor of truth and wisdom. Or maybe you're a builder or like a construction worker and you can help build God's kingdom. Or maybe you're um, an artist and you're a co-creator with God. Maybe you're... In the, in, the, in the medical industry, you're in the medical world, and you're actually participating with God in bringing healing to humanity. And God can use all of those things about us and deploy them for his purposes. And I think this is kind of what I'm driving towards here, is that Jesus will give us more than an occupation. He will give us a vocation. And those are two very different things. An occupation is what we do to earn a living. It's important. we got to work. we got to pay the bills. An occupation is what we do to earn a living, but a vocation is what we do when we're truly living. Vocation is about calling and purpose. It's about us understanding and knowing the way God designed us and wired us, our unique gifting, our unique calling, our unique contribution that we can make to the world. And we believe this, we preach this all the time here, that there's only one of you in the world ever. There's only one you. And God designed you specifically and intricately and on purpose to make a contribution to the world that no one else in all of human history can make. And when we say yes to Jesus, when we say, when he says, come follow me, and we respond to that and we say yes to him, He will transform us and get us in alignment with who he created us to actually be. And we can live on purpose doing the things that he has set us out to do. And some of those things are as spiritual as playing guitar up here. I'm going to call Taylor out. Playing guitar up here and leading us in worship. But just as spiritual as him playing guitar and leading worship is him working in his day job repairing broken guitars. It's a beautiful, holy act. It's an act of art and craftsmanship and of customer service and of beauty. And just as important as strumming that thing and leading us, which feels very spiritual, repairing a broken guitar, which is what Taylor does to earn a living, is just as spiritual. And it it makes me think about this, this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He says, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. See, this is about us finding alignment with not only the things that we've got to do to be a human and make a living, But to be about his kingdom purposes, he can bring alignment with that in our lives and and bring a whole new sense of meaning and purpose to what we do. Ultimately, Jesus is inviting us to be on his team and to be about his business. 
He says, come and follow me. And I will make you, pause, in a painfully slow process that you will be so impatient with, I will make you about my business. I will make you fishers of men. And I, I, I want to kind of tangent for a second here on, on his strategy. Because a lot of times when we think about what God's business is like, we think about professional Christians. You know what I mean? Like people who stand on a mic. Um, and, and what's very, or, or people who do holy things, people who, who work at churches. One of the unique things about our church, and, and I believe the way that, that God has moved throughout all of human history, is he employs anyone who says yes to him. See, if you say yes to Jesus, if you respond to his come, follow me invitation, you're on the team. And he, he has holy things for you to do, even though they might not seem all that holy. That, that he, he, he wants to employ you to be about his kingdom business. And he, his plan A, his strategy, is to go reach the world through simple people like us. It's crazy. It's a decentralized model instead of a centralized model. Centralized would be like, here I am, everyone come to me. That would, Jesus could be standing on a hill. You could see it. You could be like, there he is. But he says, no, no, no. We're going to decentralize. We're going to, I want you to go out to them. And we're going to spread like wildfire. Oh, and this has happened over the last 2,000 years that Christianity has spread through all the world person to person, witness to witness. And we get to go be a part of his kingdom work as we go take the gospel. The gospel is the good news and his good works combined together. And we get to tell people about Jesus and help them experience the fullness of life. And this happens through relationships. I think about the way that God has used me in the most mundane ways. You know, I didn't start out like leading a church or preaching. Where God really started using me was in high school after I came to Christ. And he started identifying my giftings. And one stupid talent that I had was I could play the guitar. Not even that good. But I knew when I came to Jesus, this come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I knew that that meant something for my life. And so I was immediately on mission in my high school. And of course, as I, as I started to follow Jesus, I, got, I collected more and more Christian friends and I had started doing church things. I used that guitar and I, I played it at church and I led worship music, believe it or not. I can't, still can't sing. But I just knew kind of inherently that what Jesus was calling me to was not to just go be part of the holy huddle but to stay engaged with people who were far from him and I became a chameleon on my high school campus I was friends with everyone I was like the punk skater kid um, who used to get beat up by the gangbangers but for whatever reason I had favor with the Wu-Tang Clan and and it all happened because we were in a guitar class together and there were these we called them thugs, they called themselves thugs, um, who appreciated my ability to play guitar. And so I just sat with people who wanted to learn how to play the guitar and strummed away. Or I was purposeful on my football team. In fact, one year I didn't even want to play football anymore, but I stayed and played because I thought that that would be a good mission field for me to be in- invested in. And what God began to highlight in my life through this is a leadership gifting. And I had no idea I was a leader. It wasn't until I started purposing my life towards the purposes of God that all of these giftings and, and, and natural and supernatural things that God was doing in my heart began to kind of blossom and flourish. And I didn't have to go far. Like long before I studied the Bible in college and started a church and all that, God was using me right where I was on a high school campus. And God wants to use you right 
where you are. It's not jujitsu where you got to go like level up and get stripes on your belt or get new belts. There's no, there's no proving yourself. There's no proving ground. There's no mat to prove yourself on. It's just saying yes. Come. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of people. And what we'll see throughout the life of Peter over the next several weeks and months is that God transformed Peter in miraculous ways. And he used Peter in miraculous ways. Peter went from a fisherman to an amazing, amazing man of God who taught and led and preached and wrote scripture and brought the good news of the gospel outside of the walls of the constricted Judaism, brought it to the Gentiles through a revelation that God gave him. And we'll see that God did all of these miraculous works, but how did Peter end up in that room when the two came back from the road to Emmaus and said, Jesus revealed himself to Peter? Oh, it started back at the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus showed up, he said, come, follow me. And this is the same invitation that he gives every single one of us daily. And man, it's a hard thing to see God at work in our lives and through our lives on a day-to-day basis. But if you pause for a moment and you look back from now, you look back over the landscape of your life to the time that you first encountered Jesus, and you just stopped and took inventory of the way God has used you. I don't care if it's been a week or 40 years. God will use you in miraculous ways. And it is an incredible privilege to be on his team and to be about his business. Would you pray with me? God, there are There are some doubters in the room that can't find a way to believe that you could do anything good through their broken lives. God, there may be somebody in the room this morning, God, that has never responded to your invitation to follow you. God, I just pray that this morning would be a moment where they can hear your invitation and respond just today. God, they'll need to do it again tomorrow and the the day after that. But God, I just pray, Lord, if you're beckoning someone in this room to yourself now, God, that they would just open their hearts to you and say, Jesus, I'll follow you. I'll go where you go. And God, would you make them in your way and in your time, exactly who you want them to be. And God, I think there are some folks in the room that have been used in mighty ways by you. And all they can think about is the good old days. Remember when. And whether they've realized it or not, somewhere along the way, They woke up one morning and they said, not today. Because of that, Lord, we've lost our way. We've lost access to your power, to your might, to your transformation power, God. And Lord, we need to access it again. And Lord, the way you want to do that is by giving us the same invitation. Come, follow me. And so God, I pray for for anybody in the room that just has strayed off course, they've strayed off the path. But God, they long to be a person of purpose and have a life of significance and to be about your business. 
Jesus, I pray that today they would just say, I'll follow you. And God, may you transform all of us into your image and into your likeness. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're going to stand and worship with one last song. If you'd like prayer, we would love to pray with you over here at the piano. I know you can't see it if you're in the back, but it's to your right. And we would just love to pray with you, whatever your needs are. Let's stand and worship together.